Right, so what have we covered so far in this series? Well, we entered chapter 1 and we took a look at Xerxes the king. And we decided, I'm hoping, I made the decision, uh, I, I'm hoping you did as well, that this is not a king that you would want to have for yourself. I'm hoping that you saw him for what he was, a corrupt, corrupt man who fed the addictions of the people, who appealed to the lowest common denominator. And I hope that as we went further into chapter 1 and you saw just what was going on in this kingdom with regards to people's behavior and and people's attitudes toward, toward women and people's attitudes toward each other, I hope that you came to the conclusion, as I did, that this was not only not a king that we would want to have, but also not a kingdom that we would want to live in. And so that's what we dealt with in chapter 1. And then we, then we meet Esther and we get into, get into this, uh, the story part of things. We, we, we move into the, the immediate situation that faced Esther and Mordecai and frankly all of the Jewish people. Because we, we made the comment that, that Mordecai and Esther uh, living away from God's people in Jerusalem that they were pretty much living under the radar in Susa, in, in Persia. They were kind of going along to get along. It doesn't mention them doing any praying. It doesn't mention them doing any worshiping. It doesn't really, it doesn't really mention anything God's people-ish about them except the fact that they're Jews. But then something happens. That's pretty amazing. Something happens that's pretty amazing. Esther gets chosen to be part of this uh, contest, so to speak, um, of King Xerxes finding a new queen, and and she wins the contest. (coughs) So now Esther is the queen of this this vast empire. And her husband is is King Xerxes, but even... Even though this amazing thing happened, there's something else that happened that was, um, that was much more of a problem for Mordecai and Esther and for really all of the Jewish people because we don't know why, but there's this guy, Haman, and he's a bad guy. And he's a guy that, that comes from a people, comes from ancestors that have always stood against God and always stood against God's people. And as soon as he is elevated to this position of power by King Xerxes, um, everybody is supposed to bow down to him, but one person decides, you know what, this is the line I won't cross. Mordecai, as a Jew, as one of God's people, will not bow down to this person who stands against God and everything that God loves. And so Haman comes up with this plan, not just to get back at Mordecai, but in fact, to annihilate the entire Jewish people. And Haman's got the kind of influence in a corrupt kingdom like this, with a corrupt king like this, to actually make this happen. And so he goes to King Xerxes, and he's kind of, uh, you know, gives his own version of the story, and he, he kind of he kind of runs the Jews down and, and, and calls them out for being kind of separate and, and not part of the team. And Xerxes pretty much says, hey, great, I don't need them. Do with them what you want. And so, by royal decree, the date is set now for the complete annihilation of all of the Jews across the Persian Empire. Well, this is a problem. And so Mordecai, at the end of last week, if you remember, goes to Esther and says, look, Esther, you need to take a proper stand for God and for God's people. Otherwise, we're done. And don't think that being in the palace is going to to save you or spare you. Because if we're destroyed, you're coming with us. And so coming into chapter 5 here, Esther has made the decision 
but she's going to take this stand. So, Esther, her faith challenged by Mordecai, decides to stand up and do something about it. And actually, there's two things that she needs to accomplish. And what we're going to deal with today is just the first thing. And I suppose laying the groundwork for the second thing. But, but here's what she needs to accomplish. First, she must risk her own life in seeking an unauthorized visit to King Xerxes, seeking an unauthorized audience with King Xerxes. So first she has to uh, even get an opportunity to talk with him without being executed. And, And second, perhaps more difficultly, she has to persuade the king to nullify a previous decision that he made, well, perhaps not made, but at least endorsed, thereby sparing the Jews in the Persian Empire from annihilation. So this is a tall order. But I want you to notice, because some of you weren't happy when I introduced Esther to you a couple of weeks ago as not the God-fearing woman that she would become, but as someone who is a little bit wishy-washy, I want to point out tonight that by virtue of Esther's willingness to stand up to the most powerful man in the entire world at that time, Esther is certainly coming along now spiritually. Esther is now seeing a much bigger picture than she had when she entered the story. She's coming to understand that some things, God's things in particular, are worth fighting for. And she also, in her newfound spiritual maturity, realizes that there is no way that she can do this alone. So through Mordecai, she makes this request that all the Jews in the Persian Empire engage in prayer and fasting. The whole Old Testament church, in in other words, interceding on behalf of her and on behalf of this dire situation. And not only does she call everyone else to do it, but she engages in this herself. She leads by example. Esther herself fasted and prayed for her strength and her guidance and I'm sure her results. And so in the verses that we just read, though he is not mentioned, again, he's not mentioned anywhere in this book, God provides wisdom for Esther as she begins to execute this plan to save her people. So in verse 1, she puts on her royal robe, she, she makes herself up the best that she can, and she goes and seeks an audience with King Xerxes. And I want you to understand that she has no way of knowing how she would be received. This was quite impertinent, quite uncommon on her part to go to the king unbidden. You have to understand that. And you have to understand also what what Esther understood and what pretty much everybody in that kingdom probably had an inkling of, that Xerxes was this egotistical and unpredictable and reactionary and impulsive and a little bit crazy guy. All we have to do is remember back to how he dealt with that situation with Vashti uh, to kind of see some of that coming out in him. But I also should mention that that in the Persian Empire at that time, there was a law on the books that that anyone who approached King Xerxes, who was God, lowercase g, on earth, anyone who approached Xerxes without an invitation could, if he felt inclined to do so, could be punished, even receive a death sentence. And we also read, this is interesting, we're going to come back to this at the very end, that the sign of invitation, the sign that punishment was not going to come and execution was not going to come, was the extension of this scepter, holding out this gold scepter. And uh, as an aside, this is part of what we'll come back to, 
uh, thinking about our themes of king and kingdom in this uh, sermon series. I mean, it seems a little strange to us, and, and you know, we can't help but wonder a little bit about this, but we certainly notice the fear and the uncertainties of coming into this earthly king's presence. So as Esther comes into the king's presence, what she's doing is she's hoping and praying that 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 scepter will be extended. That's probably what she's watching for, that scepter being extended. Ah, the uncertainty, the fear, the, the, the just twisted up stomach while you're waiting for that, for that action from the king. And I ask you again, as I've asked you in previous weeks, can't we do better than that? Don't we long for something more out of our king and out of our kingdom? Well, Xerxes has foolishly put himself in the place of God, and it's true that this guy holds the power of life and death, at least over his subjects, and that is a terrifying thought. But take heart, take heart, because God will use Xerxes for his redemptive purposes, defending and preserving his church and his people. Let's put this into perspective a minute. I was going to do this a little bit later. But um, you have to understand that as powerful and as godlike as Xerxes might have seemed, as Xerxes might have thought he was during his time, keep in mind that he is remembered primarily at this point in history just as the person, the person who kind of rubbed shoulders with the Christian community. I mean, he's remembered primarily for his, his brief involvement with God's people. And so... <laughs> Let me just remind you, if you're getting a little bit nervous, you probably aren't, you know the story. But some things last and some things don't. And so we pause once again to, to consider with gratitude that our God and our King Jesus is nothing like King Xerxes. Mark 10 says this, uh, Jesus called them, his disciples, together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. I mean, that is a tremendous contrast between Xerxes and our God. <clears throat> so returning to the story at hand, verse 2 already. We see that in verse 2, the prayers of Esther and the Jews are being answered. Xerxes, on this occasion, anyway, is extremely pleased with his guest. Esther looks wonderful. Uh, God has uh, worked in Xerxes' heart and made him favorably disposed toward Esther. And he is pleased with this uh, pleasant surprise. And as I mentioned before, he shows his favor and he shows his invitation. He shows his acceptance by extending that gold scepter. And so she approaches him and she touches it and the dialogue commences. And Esther's plan, the second phase, is underway. And we see in verses 3 through 8 the unfolding of Esther's strategy for persuading Xerxes. I mean, actually, we're, we're not even to the persuasion part yet. That's going to come uh, next week. But, but Esther's plan here is, is kind of fun because it's, it's really to build Xerxes' curiosity. And she's, she's almost making it a game. It's kind, of, it's kind of a tease. Xerxes says, tell me what you want. And Esther says, well, I will, but just do this. I will, but just do that. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to treat it too lightly either because... Um, this isn't just Esther being a tease. This, uh, we understand as Christians, to be God working through Esther. But anyway, she doesn't come right out and make her request. 
even though Xerxes pretty much gives her the green light, doesn't he? I mean, he says, even up to half the kingdom, and you have it. It will be given to you. And as he was, you know, as I was reading through this, and he's, he, makes that, he makes that statement twice, I couldn't, I couldn't help but think to another story in the New Testament of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Like Jesus was here to accomplish a mission, and then, and then Satan tempts him in the desert where when Jesus is at his most vulnerable, and, and, and the devil tells him that, that he can have all of these things without suffering and dying. And here I kind of see the same thing, whether Xerxes realizes it or not, going on with Xerxes and Esther. I mean, he gives her the green light to ask whatever she wants, even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. And so Esther, uh, even though she's probably sitting there very, very fearful, uh, Xerxes uh, presents her with this potential opportunity to at least completely secure her own future. And so I kind of see this, this, this offer of Xerxes, even up to half the kingdom, as a potential distraction for Esther. I mean, this would have been an, an easy spot for, for Esther to kind of scale down her expectations for her people and, and get out of this situation with something that was extremely beneficial for her. Could have been a real distraction. But Esther stays on task. She doesn't succumb to temptation. She doesn't, she doesn't tell him what she wants. She, she doesn't present her request just yet. I don't know if it was because the, the king's court was a little bit too intimidating for her or, or maybe she wanted to avoid the possibility of Xerxes uh, losing face in a, in a public way, but she decides, you know what, I don't want to do this here. It's not quite time yet. God is, is, is telling her. God is guiding her. And she is following. Instead, she invites both Xerxes and Haman to this banquet. It's been said, after all, that uh, the, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? And so they come, and they eat and drink, and as they are relaxing and enjoying themselves, all of a sudden Xerxes remembered, hey, we are here for a purpose. Esther has something on her mind, and Xerxes, because Esther is kind of withholding it from him, he is just dying to know what it is. Verse 6, as they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now what is your petition? It will be given you, and what is your request? Now Xerxes is corrupt, but he's not stupid. He must know that Esther is up to something, but he's just eaten this up, and he says again, even up to half the kingdom and it's yours, it will be granted. But still, this is the second time that Xerxes has given her the green light and she still holds her cards close to the vest. The time is still not quite right. So she replies, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Well, the plan is progressing without a hitch. Everybody is acting exactly how they're supposed to be acting. They're, they're being manipulated exactly how they're supposed to be manipulated. Are you having fun with it? So am I, yes. But verses 9 and 10 quickly bring us back to the, the razor's edge that Esther is walking here. See, we're not out of the woods yet. So Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai, that was this big reminder. He sees Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence. He was again just filled with rage at Mordecai. How dare this guy do that? Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and he went home. And we, we can't miss this because in our own situation, there are powers at work in the world, and those powers are nothing compared to God's sovereignty, but they are working for our destruction. They are working to hurt us, and that's what Haman represents here. 
And so we can't miss this depth of hatred and this depth of ferocity toward Mordecai and toward the Jews that Haman had. So it's all he can do to restrain himself. Consumed by this anger and animosity. And we can imagine him just counting the days and counting the hours and counting the minutes until the 13th day of the 12th month where the day of reckoning for the Jews will come. They will be annihilated and then he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. Never has to think about Mordecai. Never has to see him at the, at the gate. Well, he goes home in a bad mood. He needs something to cheer him up. So he calls his wife and his friends together and he boasts of his good fortune and he boasts about his wealth and he boasts about his kids and he boasts about his honor and he boasts about his status and he boasts about the access he has to the king and queen. (coughs) In other words, Haman Haman sort sort of counts his blessings in a perverse sort of way, but they're not enough. And of course they're not. Because those blessings that he's counting, those blessings that he's enjoying, those aren't blessings that are God-endorsed. He's standing against God. He's standing against God's people. And so when he counts these blessings, they don't add up to near as much as he thinks. They're not enough. Because he's positioned himself against God It's never enough, and he has no satisfaction. And so verse 14, his well-meaning wife and his friends come up with this idea. Have a gallows built, 75 feet high, and and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. On that somewhat ominous note, our chapter ends. But we know some things that Haman and his crew don't know. Haman has no idea that the banquet that he is going to attend the following day is being hosted by a Jew. Remember, in chapter 2, Mordecai tells Esther to keep her identity, her ancestry, a secret. And Haman still seems unaware of who she truly is. We also know that Esther has a plan at this point, and if that plan is successful, Mordecai certainly is not going to find himself in a good spot. But most important, we know that God is present and at work in this situation, and we are beginning to see, even though things haven't played out completely yet, that Haman is actually caught like a fly in a web. He is caught not in his own plan and not even in Esther's plan, but in God's plan to save his people. The Old Testament church in sackcloth and ashes has been busy fasting and praying, and God in his own time and in his own way has been busy answering. And so despite the uncertain and ominous conclusion That is the takeaway from chapter 5. Esther teaches us that no matter what difficult situations and what difficult people we may face in this world, there is no person and no situation too big for God to handle. And now in conclusion, even though we are ending on kind of an ominous note, we do see that God is at work. And on a night like like this, I want you to consider, as we consider often, but it's uh, it's never enough in my mind, to consider how much God is for us. See, the image that stuck with me so much from this passage was that weird gold scepter thing. That weird gold scepter thing that that anyone who comes into the king's presence, that gold scepter being extended is like the invitation. It's it's like uh, the the welcome. It's 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 like uh, you're okay here. You're safe here. It's a it's a way to show favor. And that was the image that just stuck with me because, see, we are never going to be in a situation with our king 
where we have to be nervous and uncertain and, and hesitant to come into his presence. It's like Jesus Christ is our gold scepter. Ah, she didn't say that right. Doggone it. Jesus Christ is God's gold scepter held out to us. What Jesus did by sacrificing himself to make us right with God, he acts as a perpetually extended gold scepter, inviting us into God's presence, telling us we belong there, making a place for us so that we can always go to God without any kind of uncertainty, without any kind of hindrances, without any kind of boundaries. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news. Despite what kingdoms that we are a part of, despite what they look like in this world, the kingdom that we are truly a part of is ruled by a king that loves us and wants what's best for us and always, always makes us feel welcome in his presence. 